We are going to talk about some of the brokenness in the world in this segment, because as of yesterday, both chambers of Congress have voted to approve the so-called Respect for Marriage Act, which is really a disrespect for marriage act, leaving President Biden's signature as the final step to codifying the Supreme Court's decision redefining marriage into federal law. Now, floor amendments by some members of Congress before and after yesterday's vote in the House provided an insight into the worldview that would lead someone to not see natural marriage as God's design for humanity. Joining me now to discuss all of it is David Kloss, and he's the director of the Center for Biblical Worldview here at Family Research Council. David, good to see you this Friday. Hey, good to see you and be with you as well, Joseph. Well, I want to break down with you a lot of the commentary that was made by members of Congress, because, of course, uh, they heard from a lot of uh, their constituents, and a lot of those constituents are within the FRC community. I know that there were more than five, 500,000 contacts made by FRC supporters uh, to their congressional offices, and there was uh, at least one member of Congress who said that this was the fiercest opposition they'd seen to a piece of legislation, which is really saying something um, because it's a lame duck session, right? It, it technically, they would say, didn't even change anything because of the Obergefell decision. But we know that the moral significance of this can hardly be overstated. Now, on the floor, I want to start with Representative Good, Representative Bob Good, who's a friend of the program, and he talked about whether this means America is ceasing to be good. Let's play clipping. As President Reagan once said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. All great nations and societies fall from within. With Democrats threatening all sense of values and decency and family today, sexualizing kids in school, redefining sex and gender, trans surgery and mutilation of minors, it makes no sense for any Republican to support their efforts to codify their views on marriage. David Clawson, is that an overstatement? I don't think it is an overstatement. Um, I was thinking about the Obergefell decision earlier in the day. You know, that's only seven years ago. And just to to think about the conversations, Joseph, you and I even have on this program about preferred pronoun coercion and uh, the stuff we've seen in Loudoun County with uh, the sexual assault for those who are identifying as transgender. The, the, the things we're seeing, Joseph, we wouldn't have even imagined uh, seven years ago. You know, the slippery slope turns out to be a lot slipperier uh, than we really thought. And so I, I think this is a moment of profound uh, moral magnitude in, in this country that now right. we went from the you know five unelected bureaucrats imposing same-sex marriage in all 50 states to now a majority of senators and uh, representatives in the House of Representatives uh, putting into federal law a, a lie about something as fundamental as marriage. And, and so I think this is a, a time of profound moral reflection. And I do want to add, Joseph, I, you know, I'm a little discouraged. I know a lot of our viewers are discouraged, uh, but the Lord's still in control. And I, I also want to thank uh, the 500,000 people around the country uh, that made their voice heard. And we did peel some Republicans off who had previously voted for the bill in the summer. And then when they had another opportunity this week, they changed their vote. And so uh, FRC constituents uh, did make a difference. They were heard. And uh, that's something to be proud of. That's exactly right. Uh, we were heard, and, and, and it's interesting in public policy and really in all of life. Uh, one of the important lessons in this is that nothing is ever over. If an election goes your way or legislation goes your way, uh, it doesn't mean that you've won forever. And if legislation or an election doesn't go your way, it doesn't mean that you've lost forever. And particularly on this issue, I think it's important for us to take heart in the fact that the day is never going to arrive where we look back and we say, oh, yes, that was the moment in history when we realized men and women were functionally the same, the differences between them are irrelevant, and it doesn't matter if kids have both a mother and father. We just need to have adults in their life that care about them, and that's all we need for a thriving, flourishing society. That day will never arrive. Now, we don't know how long it's going to take before we as a civilization are able to look back and say, man, that was a mistake. And what we also don't know is how much damage is going to be done culturally and to individual lives while we continue this, this fiction that, uh, that marriage can be whatever we want it to be and kids don't need their mother and father in their lives, right? 
But the day is never going to come where uh, where history has vindicated uh, the lie that we are embracing right now. No, you're absolutely right, Joseph. And I, I think it's important to just make the point uh, that it, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. It, 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 well, let me say this. It, it matters greatly uh, what our government does. You know, our law is inherently pedagogical, and it's going to teach people uh, a view of what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. Uh, so our, our government does matter. But on this issue of marriage, you know, it doesn't actually matter what the Supreme Court says, what the U.S. Senate says, what the House of Representatives says, or even what the President of the United States says. At the end of the day, uh, marriage is marriage. Uh, marriage is that covenant relationship between a man and a woman uh, that was God's good design. Uh, that's what's foundational for flourishing communities. It's the bedrock of civilization. And so that, I think that's part of why myself and others who, you know, hold to that biblical sexual ethic, we are, we are grieving in a sense be, because our law is now going to teach uh, future generations a, a lie about marriage. And that, what that's going to mean, Joseph, in our churches, we just need to double down even more yeah. and make sure that we tell the truth about marriage. We, we explain God's good design from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5. Uh, we, we need to do even more work. Uh, persuading our, our fellow neighbors, uh, our, our friends, our family, uh, that God's design is actually what's good uh, for all people. Now, David, I want to refer back to the, the clip that I played from Representative Good, uh, who was quoting Ronald Reagan when he said, when America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And we know that people on the other side of this issue actually make strong moral, even religious arguments in support of this. And I think the reality that we have to confront is that Americans no longer agree about what good is, right? We say, oh, we want to be good. They would say we want America to be good. Uh, we would say that. They would say that. Everyone says we want America to be good. The problem is we mean very different things when we say that. We have a different definition of what good means. And fundamentally, how can we be the United States of America if we don't have a shared vision of what good is? Yeah, no, Joseph, it, it makes it more difficult. And I think that the, what we see in the rise of the divisiveness in our political discourse, you know, it just seems, you know, just a, not that long ago, you know, a generation ago, there were the different political parties uh, increased, you know, they, they had their differences, but on major fundamental issues, there was there was agreement. There, there was at least a consensus on um, basic truths, and we increasingly don't have that. Uh, I would argue that's that's the sign of a worldview divide in this country. Yeah. Uh, we talk about that a lot, Joseph. How few uh, Americans actually have a biblical worldview. That number is has plummeted in recent years, and, and so I think in moving forward. As this country continues to fracture, as we continue to lose that, that biblical basis of morality uh, that's been with us for generations, it's increasingly going to be more and more difficult uh, to see what us as Christians would call the good, the true, and the beautiful advance in public life and, and in our society. So I think it's going to be more and more difficult, which is why we need to, as Christians, uh, double down on being more and more faithful. Uh, David, you refer to a cultural divide there. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who is uh, the outgoing Speaker of the House, uh, she had this to say about what this bill is going to do. Let's play clip nine. Once signed into law, the Respect for Marriage Act will help prevent right-wing extremists from upending the lives of loving couples, traumatizing kids across the country, and turning back the clock on hard-won progress. So, David, is the result of this bill simply that people like you and me are no longer going to be allowed to traumatize children? Not at all. And that's a, a typical politician speak using incredible hyperbole. You know, it's really interesting to hear outgoing Speaker Pelosi talk about this issue. She had an uh, op-ed yesterday in the, in the Washington Post uh, where she, she talked about how this is going to bring dignity uh, to same-sex couples. And I think it's, when you hear things like that, you hear rhetoric like that from our politicians. Even on the question of dignity, we need to recognize, you know, at the end of the day, our laws actually don't confer dignity. You and I don't actually confer dignity. We just acknowledge dignity. We acknowledge something that already exists. And so, you know, it, it's interesting to look at the rhetoric ar around this bill and, and to realize that Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, and others, the things they're saying about this bill 
often are just flat out wrong uh, when they make when they say things like religious liberty is actually protected. I believe that this bill actually erodes religious liberty. When they say this is good for families and children, in my view, this is really bad for families and children because it tells a lie that every child doesn't actually need a mom and a dad. And so I think we need to hold up statements like that uh, to some more objective uh, basis. That's well said. Um, it Every time we make a decision under the premise that kids don't need both their mother and the father, the world gets worse, right? That, that we can take to the bank, and all we're going to do is continue to prove that theory, because God did not create the world so that children would be randomly assigned to adults. But, David, there's another statement that I think is a bit more compelling than the one Nancy Pelosi made, because that seemed kind of uh, transparently political. The House Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer, he basically referred to the fact that all men are created equal as justification for the redefinition of marriage. Let's play clip, clip 10. Somehow, we would interpose our own judgment, denial, denying that all people are created equal and endowed by their creator, not by us, not by the Constitution, by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Certainly pursuit of happiness means that you can love whom you choose. Now, David, there's a lot to agree with there. Our rights do come from God. We believe all men are created equal. They don't come from the government. They come from God. Uh, should we conclude, then, that it's important for us to support something like same-sex marriage? Not at all. And you're right, Joseph. Uh, some of the remarks from Steny Hoyer about being made in God's image, and that's where our rights from. That's you know that that's the Christian tradition. That's the the <laughs> impact and the influence and legacy of Christianity on this country. That's you know our Constitution. Those who wrote it understood that our rights do from come from God. But to then say that the pursuit of happiness needs to include this right to marry whom you love and to same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's not true. It, it hasn't been true for 6,000 years. You know, we've talked about this, Joseph. You know, there's other cultures in, our, in ancient history, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, who were fine with homosexuality, but they even understood that you couldn't redefine marriage. Uh, you, you shouldn't prioritize adult sexual desire or uh, the urges of two consenting adults over those of children, which is, you know, one of, one of the fruits, one of the goods of marriage. And so, again, what, what Hoyer is doing there, he's conflating two things. He's conflating something that's true, that our rights come from God, and yet that, to imply that that means we should support something that is not just something that us as Christians would oppose, but that's something that I think is going to erode even further the morality of this country and harm children. It just doesn't actually work when you look at the logic of Hoyer's argument. And I would add to that that the Constitution recognizes that all men are created equal and the law provides equal protection for every single individual. It does not provide and never has and never should provide equal protection for every relationship. Right. It does not treat every relationship the same. There's no sane person that would say every relationship that, that, that individuals can enter into should be treated equally because primarily they are not equally important to society and for obvious reasons, the most important relationship to society is the relationship that can bring children into the world. Uh, the government has never been primarily interested in the emotional involvement adults have with each other. That's not a reason to be interested in any relationship. But David, the timing of this is perhaps providential because this week is also National Bible Week. And in recognition of National Bible Week, Congressman Glenn Grothman referenced George Washington's belief about what is necessary for national prosperity. And I think it's instructive in the context of our debate over marriage. Let's play clip 13. George Washington said it's impossible to govern the world without God in the Bible. Of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, our belief, our religious and morality are indispensable supporters. Clearly, if you want to understand the Constitution, you have to understand the Bible. And that's why John Adams said that the Constitution is made only for a moral and religious people and totally unfit for any other kind. David, if, as John Adams said there, the uh, 
Constitution is made for a moral and religious people. What does that mean for us in the week that we have redefined marriage in about 40 seconds? Yeah, it's. I think our founders would be shocked if they saw the events of this past week. Uh, you know, we always legislate a form of morality. That's what you're doing when you're legislating. And to go to something as basic as marriage and kind of take a sledgehammer at it, uh, that it's not good, Joseph. Um, it, I think it's problematic for all the issues we've just said. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the Bible is a book of hope. I think that's been the theme for the National Bible Week. The Bible is hope. And at the end of the day, even though we're discouraged about this vote, the Bible does offer a lot of hope. And those who follow Christ, that's where our stake is at the end of the day, not in our politicians. David Clausen, as always, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Joseph.